In several of the Faroese villages, we find sites with visible structures to which there are attached the name element of Burnhus, an English prayer house. Place names as well as local legends are referring to these uh, structures, interpreting them as churches, <coughs> chapels, or prayer houses. These structures, usually modest in extent, appearing as a grass grown elevation in the terrain, and in some cases encircled by a low, uh, low uh, roughly circular dike, have always attracted the attention of the local community as well as archaeologists. But so far, they have not caused greater investigations, and they hardly referred to in professional publications. This may be bound up with the limited favour church archaeological issues have had in general, except from the ecclesiastical remains at the medieval bishopric in Chichibur. So in this uh, inter uh, presentation, I shall try to approach this issue and give a new view of the present knowledge. Also, I wish to put uh, these remains into a broader connection with settlement. As I mentioned, our knowledge to this issue in the Faroes mainly derives from local legends and place names. At some locations, there are just a narrative mentioned that a so-called uh, burn ruse once stood at the spot without any remains of such a structure at the site at all. In such cases, the name can be attached to different, uh, different uh, natural geological features in the surrounding landscape. Examples such as these we see here on this slide. And again, at other locations, there are buildings or outhouses referred to as the Burnhus, indicating a possible previous function of the building. Then there are locations where only legends, not a certain place name, are attached to physical remains in the landscape. Examples such as this mound by the stream of Lopran's arm in the village of Lopran and Suroy. Distinct remains of ancient settlement, such as ruins or elevations in the field, which the community naturally has interpreted and given a name. And then there are sites to which are attached both legends, place names, physical remains, as well as information regarding finds from the spot. Sites like these are shown on this slide. So, as you can see, we have a whole range of sites with the name element of Burn who spread around the islands. The question is though, whether we can be sure that these are evidencing that a chapel once stood at, the, at that spe specific site or not. Regarding names that only are related to natural formations in the landscape, we always have to consider whether the name can be derived from softly, something that earlier was visible on the spot, but now is vanished. For example, a ruin to which an explanatory legend uh, is attached, ex explaining its original use. But we also have to pay attention to the fact that other reasons may have caused the name. For example, facts like ownership to a certain piece of land and so on. So we are dealing with facts that can be very difficult to verify, if possible at all. What has our special concern here today are sites where it is possible to show physical remains to which are connected this special name element. So in the following, I should try to characterize such structures in the Faroese landscape. In the Faroes, the so-called burnhus are the remains of small buildings, often encircled by a nearly or semi-circular dike, as this one, uh, the Burnstof in Lerwick, a ruin measuring 25 meters in diameter, being the best preserved of its kind. Until 2009, only two of these chapels have been examined archaeologically. Therefore, our knowledge about this category of ecclesiastical Faroes heritage has been, and in fact still is, quite limited. During his career as Faroe state antiquarian, medieval church issues were one of Sveridal's main fields of interest. Dahl became state antiquarian by the establishment of the Faroe National Museum in 1952. This interest expressed itself through his great engagement regarding the ancient heritage uh, at the bishop's seat in Chichibur. In this connection, the chapel sites were clearly favoured by him, even this research never became so visible 
in his later publications, but we find it in the museum archives. The ruin at Abernusbeche on the westernmost island of Faroes, Mijines, was partly investigated archaeologically in 1960 and 1961, and again in 1962 by Sveretal, together with his Danish colleague Peter Wilhelm Glob, then Danish state antiquarian. The excavation was never finished and the post excavation work was never carried out. But from the, archive, um, from the archive material at our museum, it seems obvious that this was indeed a chapel site, comprising building remains of at least two faces, a later one which was separated from an older one by a, large, a layer clearly indicating that the older structure had burnt down. <coughs> the later structure was apparently a rectangular building, 5.5 uh, by 3.5 meters wide internally and with a 70 centimeter wide door opening in the west gable and with a paved floor. The ruin is surrounded by a dike. This is a, this is a small stream and you have uh, the dike here and the location of the room. <coughs> and by trenching the enclosed area, badly decomposed human remains were found to verify its past use for burial. The artifacts found included a candlestick of local basalt formed as a Gothic base of a column, 11, 11 centimeter high, and a pair of tweezers of bronze from the upper layer, as well as some fragments of local ceramics from the lower layer, indicating a medieval date for the later building. But it does not allow any wider conclusions such as clarifying its function. <coughs> Again, in 1967, Dahl carried out a limited excavation to the site of Abbundus Bakka in the village of Skarvanes on Sandor. The site is located by a possible abandoned farm indicated by several artefacts found during cultivation work at the site, which is called Utoftum, at the ruins. Only the eastern uh, gable, uh, the eastern part of, of the building was more or less preserved in the length of 4 meters and 2.8 meters wide. Only the lower parts of the walls were left, the rest were demolished by cultivation work at the site, though the stone paved floor was quite intact. There were no traces of burials in the area, so we must conclude that the excavation did not reveal any evidence with neither which ne neither clarifies questions regarding the function of the structure nor the dating of it. However, in June 1989, a local person presented me with a stone that he just had found in the field next to this site. Three small, simple Latin crosses are inc incised into these, uh, well, about 35 centimeters large stone um, and may probably be indi indicative of former religious activity at the site. But it was not until 2008 that the, uh, another uh, Bernhus site was examined, the one of a Bernhus flirte in the village of Valpa in the island of Sulu, which then was surveyed by Hedge Mikkelsen here and myself, assisted by our colleague Hagen Andreasen from our museum. What we found here are the remains of what we interpret as an abandoned farm site and attached to which there is a cemetery. And luckily, we were able to put a date to the activity of the site by dating a human tibia that was coming out of the cliff section <coughs> by the possible cemetery. This here, the bone there. And the bone was dated to the years around 1000 AD. Whether we have uh, information about all existing burned sites on the islands is not to say, because as recently as 2003, I was informed about another site of which we never had heard about. Earlier, we hamrabo in the village of Kotlafir, just north of Tosha. Valid for all these chapel sites is that none of them have been investigated thoroughly. We lack basic archaeological investigations, such as systematic surveys and excavations. But the archaeological potential of these sites has been clearly demonstrated. However, generally the Bernus sites have been considered to be chapels or private churches that were abolished during the Reformation. 
as for example uh, stated by Sveridal. Even uh, there more recently has been a tendency to connect them to an Irish-Scottish context bringing Irish monks on stage, as well as the semicircular shape of the surrounding dikes, which should prove a link to Irish Christianity and therefore uh, a very early date. However, this view is not based on archaeological investigations and the pharaohs, but only on comparison with parallels of circular church types from that area. Some relevant questions regarding these chapels uh, or chapel sites are who built them and when, <coughs> what status did they have within the church hierarchy, and how did they function. One way to address these questions are to investigate issues like the medieval church organization and the locations of these sites. But the organization of the Faroese medieval church, uh, including the establishment of the religious landscape into parishes, are issues we know very little about, almost nothing. To solve those questions, we need written sources, but they are non-existent, so to speak. But according to Ferenge Saga, a compilation work written in Iceland, yeah, about 1200, the Christianization of the islands was accepted at the Althing of Toshan in the year 1998. This is the formal conversion of the islands. But no doubt that most scholars today are of the opinion that the introduction of and the conversion of the Scandinavian people to Christianity was a long process rather than happening overnight. <coughs> this also seems to be the case of the pharaohs, where, for example, these two small wooden crosses were found in a Viking farm at Totanis, which clearly are evidencing this long process. Regarding the, spa the sparse sources for Faroese medieval church archaeology um, and history, it's worth noting that there is only one medieval parish church still in use in the Faroes, the stone-built whitewashed church in Chichiburger, which originally had another position as it was built as a bishop's church, in fact the Faroe Cathedral built in the 13th century. All other physical evidence is hidden below the ground because of the sparse written medieval sources. So we have to turn to post-reformation documentary evidence as well. And according to a book published in 1673 uh, describing the Faroese society, there were 39 churches uh, in the islands by the Reformation located in seven parishes. But in 1632, the Norwegian cleric Peter Clausen Fries is referring to a narrative by a Faroese student of 1592 that mentioned a list of churches according to which there were 11 to 15 churches more prior to the Great Plague. So this gives us a hint to that there existed at least more churches in the early Middle Ages, a picture we also see from the other areas in the North Atlantic. But another way to gain knowledge about these matters is to look at the situation in the neighbourhood countries. We may suppose that the organisation of the Faroes followed the development, for example in Scandinavia and in Western Norway, the Gulatings area in particular, having in mind how much the Gulatings legislation marked the development of Faroe society. Um, I will touch upon uh, the landscape. So regarding the location of these Faroese chapels or churches, it may be of interest to view these ruins and sites on a settlement historical background. The material I'm using in this discussion comprises 35 sites. 18 are located within the infield, and interestingly, there are no visible cultural remains in the outfield sites. So what question does this facts rise? It's striking, though, that nine of these 18 chapel sites are not even located within the infield and in the vicinity of the settlements, but at the so-called Heimrus, the proper site for the farm buildings, as you may call a, a Norwegian too, here exemplified by this Heimrus site in the small island of Koster. Uh, and here we have to mention the so-called old traditional church sites, that Arne Tortelsson, former state antiquary, included into his settlement historical research in the 1970s. This was because of the traditional view or idea that the most comprehensive and important 
farms were to be found at the church sites at the moment the first church was founded early in the 10th century. Uh, when Torsason expressed these views, uh, archaeological excavations only had been carried out at two uh, of these church sites, in Santur, Sandoi, and in Kvalpa, Sudoi. Since then, this picture has been extended a lot. And it's obvious that the locals have sticked to these traditional locations. Only special circumstances, for example, natural conditions, caused that the church and the church were moved to another site within the village, as in this village, Sumpa, where a threat of coastal, uh, or the coastal erosion uh, were threatening uh, uh, the church site, and the church was in the 19th century moved further up here. Contrary, uh, contrary to this, there are also evidence that the settlement the farm was relocated some time back in history, while the church kept its location. A situation which is creating a strange picture of a church lying isolated in the village. In such instances, it has been possible to verify the true settlement situation of these sites through archaeological assessment and observations in the surrounding areas. No doubt, the best example uh, of, of this is here in Sandur, Vichichiger, on, on Sunday. But there, could, uh, there are several other sites that could be mentioned. So, from what I have said here, it must be clear that in the Pharaohs, the church site always has been very closely associated with the settlement or farm site, probably the first and main farm on the site. And in support to this view is Tortesa's research into place names with the naming element of Burgur, uh, meaning uh, cultivated infield or the farm. He showed that all of the six villages with this name element are church villages. And taken as a group, these are far the most wealthiest uh, regarding land property comprising farms of quite considerable uh, sizes. I think I will, I will leave it here, but uh, I was going to talk about cemeteries and church sites as well, but maybe we can uh, grasp into that uh, during the discussion. So uh, I will... will uh, Hello to the next speaker.